book in the Bible. So the, the, not talking about extra biblical books or anything like that. Just like, you know, just... The ESV, NIV, what my Bible's not important to have. There it is. ESV, NIV, KGB. What is the only book in that Bible where you can find the holiday known as Hanukkah? What is the only book in the Bible in which the holiday called Hanukkah can be found? Can be found. Only, only book in your Bible. It's only mentioned one time in this Bible. In which which book is it? Will Will thinks he knows. He's got a smile. <laughs> All right, take a few more minutes. I, I taught uh, with my dad up at a Emerging Leaders College in Georgia, and this is one of the questions I asked, and all these intense Bible students were stumped. They enjoyed it then. Michelle's cheating, Googling it. It's not supposed to happen that way. <laughs> what? Huh? What did I say? Yeah. On the Bible study thing? Oh, I didn't put anything. Oh, I don't think I put anything. If I did, it was not me. It was Stacy. She's my communications coordinator, director. <laughs> All right, take one more minute. It's just a completion grade, so it's not. <laughs> it's a daily grade. Wait, we're not going to read these out loud, are we? I think we are. Oh, no. I think we're <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll read your trivia question answers and then, or get you to read them, and then I'll use the uh, what did you hope to learn thing. From, do I need to put the questions back up there? Or do I want to see? You want me to have to go? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. You want to put the questions back up? Can I open my Bible and figure this out? Can I just get it? You can, but you're probably not going to find it. It's really hard. It's really hard to find. I didn't answer any of those questions. Especially specific book. Like... You're that one student in the class that <laughs> just doesn't participate. <laughs> I have to put her on the hallway. That's why I was sitting in the back of the class. I call the resource officer. I don't know what to do with this lady. <laughs> my mom and dad tonight. Um, yeah. I'll be calling your parents later. I know you're actually. Can you answer the question on the actual PowerPoint on the blue? Um, yeah. I was answering that question. I'm going between two books. So now you're going to be able to read it because I get to Okay. It's too late every now. Yeah, yeah, Let me call on somebody. Does anyone have a guess on the uh, the Hanukkah trivia it's question? One of the gospels, yeah. right? What? Is it Maccabees? It's Maccabees is in our Bible. Yeah, but Maccabees is in a Catholic Bible. So, but not in like a typical like I'm talking about like you know just typical NIV, ESV, King James version. It oh, wouldn't be you wouldn't have Mac Maccabees in that. Yeah, you wouldn't have the um, apocryphal books in it. So like you know just the the typical you know Christian Jewish canon. Um, mm. What. Uh, what book would it be found? Anybody have another guess? But, I mean, yeah, it, the story of Hanukkah is in the Maccabees, but okay. it wouldn't be found um, in our Bibles. Gotcha. Um, yeah, it's you guess? It's one of the Gospels, right? Because Jesus goes somewhere <laughs> oh. during the time of Hanukkah. Anybody have another guess? Okay. What'd you guess, Josh? I didn't even guess. Yeah. Like, I, I stopped making What'd you good. guess, Mom? <laughs> I put Malachi, but it made it mm -hmm. too far. Okay. The only place in our Bibles in which the holiday called Hanukkah can be found is John chapter 10, John. where Jesus goes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she said the gospel. Yeah. I was going, As, you were close. I was going yeah. between Mark and John. And like, John 10. In there. Yep, John chapter 10. And it's called the festival of, of uh, dedication, or the feast of dedication, because Hanukkah is a Hebrew word which means dedication, Hanukkah. Um, 
there is a guy in the Bible named Hanok. He was the son of Cain. I want to say, you have to check me on that. Son of Cain, and he went around and built cities and uh, would name cities after Hanok. He would name, he would dedicate them after the de- his son literally meant dedicated. Um, so uh, this little bit tri- uh, Bible trivia for you, but what that did it basically kind of um, it shows you how. Uh, you know, Hanukkah, when you think of Hanukkah, you think of like, you know, Adam Sandler and yarmulkes and, you know, just like, you know, all these menorahs and stuff. You think of like all these uh, just very uh, um, stereotypical Jewish things, you know, when you think of Hanukkah, it's like the, the Jewish Christmas, right? But what we find, the only place in our Bible is our Savior going to the temple and he traveled from uh, north of the, the Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem, which would have been uh, a very treacherous journey, which would have taken two to three days on foot to do, to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of, of dedication or Hanukkah. So he was there in the temple and walking around, and he used that opportunity to say that I am the light of the world. And he used that opportunity to say that, um, you know, this is great what you're doing, to celebrating the rededication of the temple after the, um, the Maccabean revolt that happened. Um, he used that as an opportunity to stand up and say that basically I'm the light of the world. Um, it would have been a time where, you know, the miracle of lights, when the, the lights burned miraculously for eight days, when it should have only burn for one, that was the lights of the menorah, which is, you know, kind of the light of the world. He was saying, I'm epitomizing that thing that miraculously burned. So um, it's kind of a cool thing. It shows you, I mean, what it does is it has this very Jewish thing just kind of implanted in the book of John, which... Um, you know, you wouldn't think otherwise, Feast of Dedication, I don't know what that is, but it's just some Jewish thing, but that's like a big deal, Hanukkah, right? So, um, yeah, I just want to throw that out there for it. But I'll collect your papers, and just kind of, what it'll do is kind of help me steer future sessions as far as, um, as what to touch on, what you guys hope to learn, and kind of, kind of cater it towards you. Um, something I want to touch on real quick was, uh, I've, Stacey and I have been practicing um, Messianic Judaism for the better part of eight years, Stace, she's going to correct me, um, we've been studying and living more or less a Jewish life centered on Jesus. That being said, um, uh, you'll hear me say Jesus, you'll hear me say Yeshua. Uh, it's just kind of a habit, like over the course of like seven years, I've started to say Yeshua a lot. Um, Yeshua is what he would have gone by, uh, what his mother called him. It, in Hebrew, it means salvation. Um, and it's kind of a deriv- derivative of Yehoshua. It's a shortened version of Yehoshua. And so he would have been, he would have, literally you would hear him, his mother saying, salvation, salvation, you know, salvation, come here, you know, or different things like that. So when he stands up and, um, uh, you know, says that he's the salvation, or, or um, when you say the daily prayers in, in the synagogue and you say, um, you know, cause your salvation to sprout, they're saying cause your Yeshua to sprout forth. Um, so anytime you see in your Hebrew Bibles, you see the word salvation in the English, more than likely, it's in the Hebrew behind it, it is some form of Yeshua. So you can almost play, play a little bit with that and say, like, you know, where you see, like, bring your, bring your Yeshua. You know, it's saying Jesus there, in a sense. So um, you'll hear me inter- interchangeably kind of use Jesus and Yeshua, because I know we have, you know, um, you guys have been involved in, in Messianic Hebrew roots kind of stuff, and, and, you know, you guys are more Christian, you know, backgrounds and stuff. So I want to try to take those into consideration when I'm referring to this guy. <laughs> But um, one thing I want to start off with, well, let me back up. Why study the teachings of Jesus from a Jewish perspective? Anybody have any ideas? Why would you guys chime in as much as you want? The, 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 little, the, the uh, little I talk, the better. But why would we want to study the life of our Savior from a Jewish perspective? Anybody have any ideas? For me, I just put, um, just to have a deeper understanding of Jesus' day-to-day life. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and then a greater understanding slash appreciation for just the culture that yeah. he lived in and the things that he did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, living a Jewish life is a very day-to-day thing, too. It involves, you know, every day there is something that you do that is Jewish. And, mm-hmm. like, so when he woke up in the morning, he would have, at sunrise, put on a prayer shawl and wrapped to fill in around his arms and said the daily prayers. He would have started with the Shema, which is, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he would have gone through a series of prayers probably three times a day, at least from his bar mitzvah, age 13, up until his death. He would have done that. Um, it's a very Jewish thing to do. Um, 
So yeah, that's, that's good just to know what he did from day to day. Um, anybody else have anything else they want to contribute? Well, if you're going to be in a relationship with someone, you need to understand where they're coming from. Like yeah. if you marry someone from the South, you know, yeah. you got to understand that you, you, you don't get up in the morning and not say, good morning, how are you? You, have to, you can't be You just start frying okra. Like, what do you okay. want? What do you want to do? Where are you going today? So, um, yeah. So he said you kind of, to yeah. relationship really helps, you know. That's like verbatim one of my slides here in a second. But <laughs> yeah, like when I married Stacy, fortunately we come from pretty similar cultures, but when I married Stacy, um, uh, she, you know, her family just did things differently. You guys probably experienced that. You know, you go to your parents' house and it's like, there's a different dynamic there yeah. um, than the way my parents did. You know, for instance, her family, um, she's probably listening, her family was is very uh, physically affectionate, I mean, to the point that they still have, like, I'll kiss on the lips and stuff. She's going to yell at me. But, um, I mean, they're very all, like, they're all, they're all very, like, huggy and kissy. In our family, it's not like I didn't feel, like, loved or anything, but it's like we didn't do a whole lot of hugging and a whole lot of kissing. Never really did a lot of kissing. And um, so when, you know, her mother-in-law would always hug me and kiss me goodbye, or my mother-in-law would always hug me and kiss me goodbye, it was kind of like this cultural thing. It was like, you know, but to know where she, and she's a very affectionate person, and so I'm not a very affectionate, because that's just my upbringing. So when um, we first got married, and she was always craving physical affection, and I was, you know, always kind of short of that, and always like, I don't like doing that kind of stuff, you know? It was like, there was this, this friction there, this tension there. And so to know better, like, to see and get to know her family, I was able to develop a more harmonious relationship between spouse, um, uh, groom, bride and groom. And that's kind of, neat because it translates over into we are the bride and he is our groom so in order to maintain a harmonious relationship um with him we have to kind of know the the backdrop of his culture what is his love language i guess you could say but yeah um literally if you if i love someone i want to know every facet of their life including their upbringing familial dynamics and worldview um so how did how did jesus see the world you know you know, I believe that he was divine. I believe that he was the creator that put on flesh. But, like, how did he view and interact with the world around him? Um, it's very, very interesting. Um, and then familial dynamics. How did he interact with his family? Um, what was his family like? What, did he have brothers, sisters, um, mother, father? You know, like, what, is all, what are the di- different dynamics that involve? And we should consume our minds and, our, and just, you know, we should, every, every facet of our life should be consumed with trying to, to figure out who was he um, how did he live his daily life? Because as a disciple, imitation is the number one thing. You know, that's what a disciple was, was an imitator of someone they, they called teacher. Um, oh, I kind of covered this. Getting to know a spouse's familial past informs you of the relational expectations, both of themselves and of you. And it is through this that you can begin to learn what to do and what not to do to maintain a harmonious relationship. I kind of covered that a little bit. But if you guys want to chime in, let me know. Just... Um, so uh, I likened, the other day I got glasses a few weeks back. I got glasses for the first time in years. Um, I actually wore them on a regular basis. And every time, every morning I put them on, I walk out and I can see the sunrise, especially when I'm driving to work. I'm driving east, so I see the sunrise. Um, I have this much greater appreciation for every sunrise now that I wear glasses. And I realize how blind I was or just how blurry my vision was. You know, I still appreciated the sunrises and I still appreciate the sunsets and going to the mountains and spending time and, and, you know, seeing the outdoors. But now I have this, like, added layer of appreciation of the beauty of his creation because of that. And so when I'm driving to work, it's just like, I'm just taken back because, like, this new revelation of, like, wow, the sunrise is just amazing. Um, I began to see color and detail and beauty that I didn't, I, hadn't, I didn't even know was there. You know, I could see birds flying way out in the distance across and just, like, making it complete, you know, like this painting. And that's kind of the same way when we, um, Stacey and I really started embracing um, more of the Judaic lifestyle and actually walking some of these things out, um, we began to see things in the Gospels and the Book of Acts and um, in the ministry of our Messiah that I had never seen. And it added this layer of beauty. It's not like what we had wasn't beautiful or wasn't complete, but it was like almost more complete now, if that makes sense. Like if you can even acquire that, but like um, began to see like the, the nitty gritty day in and day out of his life and um, some of the teachings that he was uh, here uh, just the other day, yesterday, actually, I was talking to a fellow teacher uh, and, and eating at lunch. And she is a pastor's wife, um, has been a Christian since she was 14 years old. 
And in five minutes, I had this conversation with her. Um, I was talking to her about the book of Acts. And I talked to her about Acts chapter 2. And I said, oh yeah, they're, you know, they're celebrating uh, Shavuot, which in English we call it Pentecost, which is uh, like the 50th day, basically, is how that translates out. And I was explaining, you know, the Shavuot was what they're celebrating. That's how you say it in Hebrew, basically. It's seven weeks after Passover. It's the 50th day after Passover, basically. And so they were gathered together in the, in the temple complex, temple proper, all these believers, and they were there celebrating the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And to her, that never really, she never made that connection. And um, I was like, they were there celebrating the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. That's when it happened. That's when the revelation of the, the law, the Torah on Mount Sinai happened was on Shavuot, on Pentecost. It was 50 days after Passover that, that God brought them into the wilderness and then revealed the Ten Commandments and the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And um, so I started bringing all these connections to her. Like in Acts chapter 2, we had, um, uh, uh, they were celebrating the giving of the law. They were in the temple and uh, they heard um, a loud wind. Um, people started speaking in other languages and other tongues. And there was people from all over, all, all walks of life. Well, if you jump back to Acts, uh, Exodus 19.20, there was a loud wind, there was a trumpet blast, um, uh, there was, the book of Exodus calls it the mixed multitude that went out of Egypt with Israel. They were literally Egyptians that were like, we want to go with them. So they're going to go with it. So it was a mixed multitude that came from all walks of life. Um, and so, uh, and Jewish tradition says that when God spoke the Torah from Mount Sinai, he spoke it in 70 languages so all the languages of the world could hear it. And so what we see in Acts chapter 2 is like they begin to speak in other languages. So all the pilgrimage, because um, Pentecost is a pilgrimage feast. So it's one of the three festivals where you have to come and you have to go to the temple. Um, and so what we see is like all these people from all over, the, um, uh, like Asia Minor, North Africa, and um, different parts of, of the world, that, that region, were there celebrating that feast. And they heard the giving of the law on our hearts through the Holy Spirit that day. So it was like this bookend. And then the, the, the cool part was, it um, goes way deeper than this, we don't have time tonight, but the, um, the really neat part was, it says in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 were added to their numbers that day. And then if you jump back in Exodus 19.20, um, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and he sees the golden calf. And then he says to the, the Levites, put on your swords and go through the camp and slay those who worship the, the image of the golden calf. And it says that 3,000 of their kinsmen were killed that day. So it's kind of like this, this reverse image of like the giving of the law on Mount Sinai with Acts chapter 2. And so basically like the speed that I just told you guys, I told this pastor's wife who's been a Christian for 14 years, or since she was 14 years old, um, you know, now she's middle age. Uh, she had tears in her eyes. Just like she, di- she had never heard any of that before. And um, I didn't know what to do. Like, I, you know, it's just like, you know, sorry, you know, but... You know, it's just things like that. Like when you know what they were doing and the Jewish faith and everything behind in the first century, why they were there. You know, what happened in Acts chapter two? Even not knowing all that is a beautiful thing. But then when you learn all like the the even bigger picture, you're like, whoa, this is this is something big here. This is a fulfillment of like a greater fulfillment of that. And it, it's putting on those pair of glasses, and you're like, whoa, I can see everything. Like. It's amazing how beautiful everything is. So that's kind of what my, I, my goal with this Bible study is, as people um, kind of um, go in and out or whatever, is, is just to help them put on a different pair of glasses and say, look, look at the scriptures like this. You, know, you can take them back off later. It doesn't matter to me. But you know, just put them on like this, and let's see if we can get to know our Messiah a little bit better. Um, yeah. You guys probably remember this bumper sticker that came out. Um, I mean, this was probably big back in the 80s even. I remember as a kid seeing this. My boss is a Jewish carpenter. And I feel like... Um, you know, that was kind of the start. I mean, it, that was just kind of like a symbol of people starting to realize and recognize and being okay with the fact that, that Jesus, Yeshua, was a Jew. Um, uh, before that, especially, um, especially, I would say, big time, like with Luther and Calvin, there was a big suppression of his Jewishness. Mm-hmm. And that he, that he um, you know, Luther, Martin Luther wrote a book, The Lies of the Jews and Their Lies, um, he was very anti-Semitic, and it's kind of a hush-hush thing, but um, that was a very suppressed uh, aspect of, of the life of our Savior, was the fact that he was Jewish. But ever since, I would say, really, um, the foundation of the nation-state of Israel in 1948, we've been a little bit more, and the freeing of uh, the Jews from the Holocaust, we've been a little bit more okay with, with um, the Jewishness of Jesus, I think. 
um, some of that anti-Semitism has kind of, as as the body of Messiah, um, we've kind of addressed some of that and put it put it to rest. And now we're okay with him being a Jewish carpenter. <laughs> but what does that mean? I mean, uh, we see we see this bumper sticker, and and we don't, at least for me, growing up um, in a, in a Protestant Christian home, I didn't really know what being Jewish meant. I thought, you know, I grew up in Florida, and the Jews that I knew were, um, you know, they they weren't living a, a pious life, a righteous life, or anything like that. They were Jews um, by ethnicity only, not by faith. And so when I heard that Jesus was Jewish, it was kind of like, um, you know, all the negative stereotypes that come with being Jewish um, kind of rush into your mind. Um, but because that's because I had a, a bad image of what Jews do and how they live, um, because I was just, I didn't see a lot of, of Jews being good Jews, I guess you could say. Um, Jesus was a good Jew. <laughs> Um, so we all know and acknowledge the fact that Jesus was a Jew from the line of David, but are we certain what implications this have? Are we certain that... So um, here's a funny story. I was working at Southeastern. I had a, a, a young man working for me as my assistant, and he was a student there as well. And he was from, like, the Gaza Strip. He was Palestinian and hated Jews. But he was working with me in my office and was a believer. He was a Christian. And... Um, one day, you know, we got to where we could really, like, start to be friends and build a rapport. And I said, is it ever awkward to you to think that you're, like, you're trusting, your faith is dependent upon a Jewish rabbi? They called him, you know, he called him a rabbi in the Gospels. Like, he was a Jewish man, like, who walked this earth. And, you know, he was thinking of it for a second, and he says, yeah, that is awkward. <laughs> you know, because he remembers, like, he remembers, yeah, he's former Muslim, converted to Christianity. And it just never struck him that he's, he's a disciple of a Jewish rabbi. You know, like, and that, that never really struck him until that day when I asked him that. And um, I, I don't keep in touch with him, but that, I lo- yeah, it's really fascinating. So it was a really inner, inner conflict there. Um, but what implications does this have, the fact that he, he is a Jew? Um, I wanted to start with the story of Joseph, and you're like, where is he going with Joseph? Um, uh, it's really fascinating, and I'm not going to get too in-depth with it tonight, but... Um, the story of Joseph is fascinating. Uh, has anyone heard of the, the idea of the two messiahs? There being Messiah ben Yosef, Joseph, which is the suffering servant, and then Messiah ben David, or David, the conquering king. This is a very Jewish concept, that there be two messiahs. They can be the same guy. They can be the same messiah. But when he comes, the first time, he will be Messiah ben Yosef. He will be a suffering servant. And this is in early, early Jewish literature that predates the time of Yeshua, um, that he will come as a suffering servant. And they call him Messiah ben Yosef, the Messiah son of Joseph, because um, Joseph was the epitome of the suffering servant. Um, and then next they say, if uh, people of Israel merit it, if they deserve it, next will come Messiah ben David, the conquering king who will reign and um, destroy the enemies of Israel. And he will reign on, on earth in his, in his earthly throne. And um, that kind of jibes with the Gospels. I mean, we have a picture of like a suffering servant, the Isaiah 53 kind of stuff, like he was stricken for us. He was bruised and, you know, he was, um, that kind of fits the picture of who Jesus was. But let's look at the life of Joseph real quick. If we see um, Joseph started out, you know, we have a picture on the left there. That's what Joseph looked like. You know, it's like, is this Joseph or is that Joseph? Well, they're both Joseph, but what truly captures the essence of Joseph? You know, as a Hebrew um, as a Hebrew nomad, as a shepherd, coming from an, a very nomadic family, um, you know, his father just would roam the, the plains and they would pitch tents and, and shepherd the flocks. And that was how they made their living. I mean, that was a very de- just down-to-earth, dirty, gritty job. And then look at, like, the other extreme of his life. He's in a palace. He's the number two guy in Pharaoh, or in, in Egypt, right below Pharaoh. Um, it just exalted this ultimate, and look at his identity change. I mean, I just pulled these on the internet. I don't, we don't know what he really looked like, but um, there's a pretty good chance he looked like something like that. I mean, so going from this humble shepherd boy living in tents to this guy here who looks nothing like it, um, even down to the fact that his name changed from Yosef, Joseph, to Zafnath Panea. Um, and we'll get into that here in a second. But so what is the real Joseph? I mean, wh- where is the real Joseph there? And what captures his essence the most? Um, I would say both do. But, um, yeah, let's keep going. Here's another uh, picture. So it goes from a shepherd boy. Uh, this is actual, an like, do what? That's an icon. An icon? That's what it's called in um, orthodoxy. Really? Yeah. Sorry. Circle around oh, no. the right. Circle around yeah, the right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it just kind of shows his, 
his Egyptian rulership. Yeah, it's a real stark contrast going from, you know, this very Hebrew guy uh, living a nomadic Hebrew life to, uh, in other words, like a, a very Gentile pagan lifestyle for all, all intents and purposes. I mean, he kept his faith in, in the one true God, but looked very Gentile on the outside. You would look at him and see an Egyptian. You wouldn't see a Hebrew sh- uh, shepherd. Um, so how does this how does this play with uh, into the life of Jesus? Well, he went from, I mentioned this earlier, he went from Yosef ben Avraham, uh, he would be the son of Avraham, uh, actually Israel, to Zaf, Zafnath Panea, which um, was his Egyptian given name that, that Pharaoh gave him, back to Yosef ben Avraham. Um, so he had a very Hebrew upbringing to an Egyptian uh, career, if you will, and then back to a Hebrew identity. Um, Yosef ben, uh, or Zaf, Zafnath Panea, literally, I, there's a lot of different translations that are a little bit off of one another, but from what I could find, that name means, his Egyptian name means from, from uh, bread of life or he who is called to life or he who is alive. So when he was called Zafnath Panea, people were calling him the bread of life because remember he saved the Egyptians from a famine and he, well, how did he do that? He stored up grain for seven years, right? In preparation for it. So he basically gave them the ability to make bread for seven years. Um, uh, and also he who is called to life or he who saves lives, in other words. So he was literally their salvation. He saved the Egyptian people um, from a great famine. And then he goes back to Joseph ben Avraham, uh, who Yosef means he who increases the fold, he who supplants, um, uh, he who adds people to the fold, basically. It's kind of the idea of like bringing more people in. And I, I remind me of John chapter 10, verse 16. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must add to them also. I must add them also. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one and one shepherd. Very uh, shepherding language, right? So um, he's probably hearkening back on the life of Joseph. So I thought that was interesting. Um, let me keep going here. This is... Um, Something I found interesting the other day, a couple days ago, um, this is from Torah portion Miketz. And for those that aren't familiar with Torah portions, um, the first five books of the Bible, back in the time of Ezra, um, the first five books were divided up into 54 portions that were read in the synagogues every week. Um, Starting with Rosh Hashanah in the fall, uh, you would start with Genesis 1, and then you'd read through all the way down to back to the fall. So we're now we're ending a Torah portion cycle, which is in De- Deuteronomy. So in the synagogue, since the time of Ezra, even, well, probably, probably predates that in the time of Babylonian exile, people were reading through the Torah portions every, every week in the synagogues. Um, but this Torah portion is in Genesis 41. It's called Miketz. And they would name the Torah portions after the first couple words in that chapter. Or that They didn't have like chapters and verses in their Bibles at that time. They just had a scroll. And so you would name the portions based off the first couple words. Well, this first portion is named Miketz. It's the second word, as you can see there. Uh, I highlighted in yellow. Uh, Miketz literally means the end or the conclusion of something. So uh, Genesis 41.1, uh, it says, Vayhi Miketz shenatim yamim upero cholem vayhine amid al hayor. At the end of two years' time, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. So at the end um, of two years. So Miketz can mean at the end. But it's interesting. Um, he's, so this is the time where Pharaoh, this, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Genesis 41. Pharaoh's having these weird dreams about the famine and everything. It's about the um, befall Egypt, right? And um, so at the end of two years, you can kind of play with that a little bit. I mean, is that like 2,000 years? Is it like prophetically speaking 2,000 years? Um, you can kind of have fun with that a little bit, but... So Miketz there, have you guys ever heard someone with the last name Katz, like a Jewish person with the last name Katz? Or um, I'm trying to think, there's like a singer-songwriter with the last name Katz. But literally, if you see someone with the last name Katz, K-A-T-Z, uh, their, their last name literally means the end or ending. So a um, little, little Hebrew trivia for you. If we jump forward seven more verses, it says, Vayi Yaketz, Pero Vahine Cholam. Uh, literally, he uh, woke up from a vision or a dream. Uh, so then Pharaoh awoke. But here we see that same word, vayakates. So the word that just set, uh, six, seven verses prior meant the end. Here, it's the same word. The same root of that word, kates, means awoke. So there's something about, in two years' time, 
there being uh, the end and an awakening. I thought it was really interesting. You can kind of play around with that, but just fun to um, fun to look into. So um, and this is another usage of Kate's. Kate's. Um, uh, basically, this is uh, Daniel getting a vision. It says, "Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the Kate's, the end." And many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. But the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But those who are wise will understand. So I thought that was interesting. It uses the word kates. It kind of shows you. So this word can mean wake up or um, come to a consciousness of something. And it can also mean the end of something, which I thought was really interesting. So we see Pharaoh uh, at the end of 2000 or two, two years waking up to something. I thought that was really neat. Um, I talked about this a little bit. Um, Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah ben David, the suffering servant, the conquering king. Um, so we have a picture here of Joseph, Joseph being sold into slavery, and then we have a picture of King David reigning on his throne. This is a very Jewish thing to believe. Like this is a very Jewish thing to to um, look at the Messiah, the coming Messiah, as. Um, so how did Yeshua, the fulfillment of the suffering servant, undergo a similar concealing? So you remember um, Joseph was sold into slavery, and then he, through a series of uh, several years uh, concealed himself, maybe not intentionally per se, but like he concealed himself from his brothers. And when his brothers came, I mean, to the fact, to the point that he was standing toe to toe with them and they could not recognize him. There's something like a supernatural blindness over them, right? And it was when he spoke to them in Hebrew and said, I'm your brother Yosef, that their eyes were then opened. Um, so there was just the concealing and then there was this revealing of who he was, his true identity as a Hebrew shepherd, as their brother, um, who they had sold, who they betrayed. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And it's really interesting that, um, uh, yeah, I'll get into it in a second here, but any questions so far? Anything you might want to add? Feel free to chime in if you want to. How, how long has that, like, to Messiah theory been? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say it predates the time of, of Yeshua. I would say that it predates. I have to double check, but I don't know exactly. Um, a lot of different rabbis contributed to that idea um, that there would be two messiahs. Yeah, I'll probably that there would be a stricken one. Words, yeah, um, that there would be a stricken messiah and then there would be a conquering king messiah. Um, that's it. Yeah. Uh, I know I'm part of my ignorance. <laughs> no, um, as you're talking and you're saying that's the Jewish belief, is that the same as the Messianic Jewish belief? Yes. I would say a vast majority believe in the conquering, uh, suffering servant and a conquering king. That that is, that, and they see that in retrospect through, and the fulfillment of that through Yeshua being the suffering servant and then the conquering king, and he's yet to come and be a conquering yeah. Oh, wait. But, yeah. Sorry. So that's basically like the first and then the second coming is... Yeah, yeah, it's what we would see as the first coming and then the second coming. Yeah. Yeah, he's correlating it with, with um, okay, I just want to make sure that you understand that I understand too. Um, that he's Yeah. And that Jewish people actually think that it's it's Messiah and Joseph and Messiah and they be. Yeah. But we but as Messianic, Yeshua, Jesus is our Messiah. We don't yeah. Joseph and David. Yeah, they're more of like a like a right? type, like a type like a foreshadow. Is that yeah. what you were asking? Yeah, and did be... and did he compute did he answer it? Like oh sorry. Okay. No, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't believe Joseph in my Messiah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I was like. Oh. Yeah. No. Then he's more of like he's more of like a type. Yeah. He's a foreshadowing of the coming of. So like when Jews before the time of Jesus would look at the story of jo- Joseph, they would say the Messiah when he comes he will suffer like Joseph. They he will. Joseph he will. Was what? They don't, they don't think Joseph was. No. No. They don't think that Joseph was a Messiah. But that that he is a type of the Messiah. Okay, I'm following now. That he's almost like this. Um. He's almost like a yeah, like almost like a little. Foreshadowing. Yeah, yeah, foreshadowing of what the Messiah will be like when he comes. Yeah. Not all the rabbis thought that, but... Yeah. And there's a 
lot of in the Old Testament. There, there are things that just jump out at me now that oh, they're talking about Jesus. They're talking about Yeshua. When I yeah. read it for before, I wouldn't have realized they were talking about. So, okay. okay. Yeah. So I'm glad you guys are Yeah, you're like, man, these guys believe Joseph is my... No. But that they, they look at them as types, both De- uh, Joseph and David, and that Messiah will, will kind of act and, and, and have the same fate as each of these men. Well, so, did they, like... Did they... I wonder how often they thought that it would be, like, um, two different people, or how often... Did they think it would be one person? Or I, two I mean, like, I wonder. That's that's yeah. that's kind of what, because like I I I'm gonna research this, but I was just interested in yeah. you know how long and how like the percentage of Jews who actually because yeah. currently it seems like there's Jews a believe that it's only only one, one coming yeah and that he will reign as king oh. yeah 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 and and it um. I would say that, especially within, there's a certain sect of Judaism right now called the Breslov community. Mm-hmm. And um, Breslov and even some, like... Uh, Which would be the really observant, like the long, curly... Yeah. Like, like, the the Orthodox? Or? No, um, they are Orthodox in practice, but they, um, they didn't originate in Eastern Europe, I don't believe. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, um, they have a very, like, almost a very messianic like kind of perspective on who the Messiah will be when he comes. They don't recognize Jesus as being the Messiah yet, but um, they almost have this like when, like for instance, they teach that when you're praying, you should picture, um, uh, they call him a sadiq, a righteous man in your mind. And sometimes they'll even have like pictures of like very righteous people in their homes. So when they're praying, they will look at a picture of a, so, and they call it, they refer to it as binding yourself to your, your, your sadiq, your righteous guy. Like, they could be, like, an uh, old Rebbe that founded the movement back in, like, the, the 1700s or something. But, you know, it's like you, you bind yourself to that Zadik because that Zadik, he, he is in the heavenly realm and he can take your prayer in he further. He has sway. Yeah. yeah, he has sway. Like, he knows where to take your prayer. Which, which is, is like a very, like, almost, Catholic. we pray. Yeah. yeah, but we pray in the name of our, of, of our Messiah. We pray in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Which is, like... We don't do that. Yeah, no, we don't bind ourselves to any random guy. <laughs> But it shows, yeah, yeah, yeah. We pray in the name of when we say when we close a prayer, we say in the name of Jesus, Amen. Which is is a very good thing to do because um, it's saying we are praying in the authority of a righteous person who um, you know carries our petitions into the, the throne room. Um, so what I'm saying with the with this one particular sect of Judaism today is when they do that they're almost doing something that's very like Christian or Messianic to do, yeah. which is really interesting that they even believe that. Um, whereas we, we've been doing it for 2,000 years. Like, please. Breslov? Brez, Breslov, yeah. Is that yeah. B-R-E-S-L-O-V? B-R-E-S-L-O-V, yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, once Jesus came on the scene and he died and was crucified and then um, his movement really took off in the first century that idea of the two messiahs mm-hmm. was definitely suppressed. Mm-hmm. Like the suffering yeah. servant and then yeah. the conquering king because... Yeah. They because... Be... Yeah, I mean, in the first century, they were occupied by Rome and they wanted, they wanted the David now. Mm-hmm. You know, they yeah. want the conquering yeah. king now to restore all of Israel because that's what the disciples said, at, you know, tell us the day and the hour that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, basically, no man knows the day or the hour. Yeah. So they wanted that David now. Um, but after that, anything that kind of looked like Jesus was definitely suppressed. Like they didn't want a lot of people believing that he was the suffering servant that they foretold would, would have. So, um, like they and they uh, even skip. So, like each week with the Torah portion, you read the, mm-hmm. something from the first five books. But they also have, um, isn't it um, something the prophets? From the prophets yeah, that is as well. A chunk of like readings from the prophets that goes with it, but they skip over Isaiah 53 mm-hmm. and those readings, the one that's, you know, he, very he's oh, pierced for our transgression, for our mm-hmm. So yeah. in Judaism, they like skip that chapter of Isaiah mm-hmm. in their um, yeah. weekly reading. They skip that one chapter because it's too... It sounds very New it Testament. It sounds too... You know, if, if, if any of those people... 
know the Jesus story, then it yeah, sounds... They would link that, yeah. So they just kind of... Yeah, Isaiah 53 is all suffering of this righteous man, and it's, it's mm-hmm. foretold hundreds of years before Jesus even comes on the scene. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in other words, did Yeshua, the fulfillment of the suffering servant, did he undergo a, a similar concealing and then a later revealing? Um, like Joseph, we see the picture of Joseph, like he sold... Uh, into the pit, like Jesus was sold, he was betrayed into the pit, and then brought out of that, and then elevated as a world ruler in the Gentile world, which Egypt would have been the superpower of the world at that time, and he's elevated as number two, um, and then he's concealed, his identity as a Hebrew is concealed, um, so does that parallel the life of Jesus? I, I have a couple of pictures here, this is the, the sacred heart Jesus, and this is the Jewish Jesus, I mean, yeah, would the real Jesus please stand up? So, I mean, I guess this is the Jesus for the past 2,000 years that we've kind of constructed based off of, like, mainly, I would say, like, Catholicism or different things that we kind of, we kind of created in our mind. This is like the, this is like the, the uh, white, blue-eyed Jesus that... The divine heart. Yeah. But then, I mean, which, which one probably captures his essence better? I mean, we, we show pictures of Joseph being a Hebrew and then a pictures of him being... A, but, I mean... In all reality, I mean, did he look like the guy on the left or did he look like the guy on the right? Probably look like the guy on the right, right? right. Um, so, I mean, pictures say a thousand words, right? And it's like, when we picture Jesus being like that, our paradigm, our, our, our concept of him changes than if we were to look at a picture of him like that, which, you know, because of uh, a lot of anti-Semitism, that is not, you know, that's, that's not doable. The one on the right, it's not, that's not okay. It's not kosher. So... so. Yeah. Uh, I uh, forget what it's called, but that's a, I think, a Greek letter. He's trying to really? um, the artist. Yeah, someone from the uh, Orthodox um, Church told me that that's like a Greek symbol or something. Interesting. But, yeah. He's throwing gang signs. Yeah, he is. <laughs> like West Side. <laughs> a, Greek, a Greek symbol. Yeah. Here's another one. Here's another one. So did he look like the guy on the left or did he look like the guy on the right? Yeah, this is the creepy guy in all the old, to, your grandmother's I Bible. I have that in my room. Like, but yeah. Yeah. Which, um, I always in my mind just thought, well, that is just what we don't know. We have no idea. Yeah. Before, yeah. You know, Polaroids or anything back then. But, <laughs> but I um, read, ran across some, some information that said that a king's son, somewhere along the way, wanted his portrait painted as deified. Weird. Oh, no. That's no, interesting. I have. And that um, that's that the actual, it's, it's a painting of a, of a real person that was a king's son, that he wanted his image deified as Jesus. So, like, how, like, you know, Disney World, they'll do the characters. Yeah. Like, so it's like, Kind of like he wanted to be like deified, like it, as in like if you just recently, it's something that I read recently, and I saw him shaking his head. So mm. you must have read that too. Have, have you read across that? I've never heard that. No. no, I've heard that. The only reason James is James in the Bible, like the brother of Jesus, is James in the Bible because didn't King James want his name in the Bible? Has anybody else read the, in, about the image? But I haven't heard the image thing. That's interesting. Jesus. That picture used to creep me out. Well, yeah. And, and see, and see, because we like look at that and we just think, uh-huh. as a matter of fact, that's him, and that's what he looks like, and that, mm-hmm. and, and knowing that we really don't know, because yeah. he probably, I've never read where he sat for any portraits or anything. Yeah. You know, those <laughs> people who are like near death experiences, and then they oh, like yeah. say they claim that, that they picture. saw Jesus yeah. and they but it wasn't him. Oh, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, it's, 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 I know there's like the Shroud of Turin where there's like supposedly his face is like in well, blood. But, um, do you start research on that? Because yeah, I will. That's that I ran across that's bizarre. And, and so it's good to know. So that was yeah. we're trying to picture Jesus, you know, when he says, seek my face, and we're literally praying, trying to seek his face, and we're not huh. we're looking at some king's son, you know, that we're trying, that wanted to be deified. We, huh. need, to, mm-hmm. we need to know, you know, that, well, let's just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, I, I mean, if I just met these two guys on the street, like, I mean, I don't know. I'd probably want to go hang out with the guy on the right as opposed to the guy. I don't know. Which one would you rather be, have babysit your kids? No. It's the but, I mean, the guy on the right, I mean, yeah, yeah. The guy on the right is clad, you know, in a, in a, in a prayer shawl. He's, he's, you know, the Jewish symbol of prayer and, and meditation. Um, I mean, how many times would Jesus have wrapped himself in one of these, you know, throughout his lifetime? And, 
the, yeah, they are. This one, though, it's creeping me out. It's following me in the room. Out is like they're very yeah. realistic. Have you seen those ones where the, the eyes follow you across yeah. the room? Yeah. Those ones are amazing. I feel like this is one. <laughs> so here's um. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Here's a whole collage of them. I was, I was just about to say that. Yeah. It's not just like the blonde hair and blue eyes or brown hair. Oh yeah. Blonde. They have the dark. There's the even the in in certain countries when is it Fidel Castro when he <laughs> maybe was like a dictator like oh, they would no. paint pictures of Jesus and it would look just like Fidel oh, Castro. Oh, no. So yeah, we've got we've got white people, Jesus and black people, Jesus, people, Asian yeah. Jesus, Rastafari. They had some of those in December. We got Republican but, Jesus down there? No. Oh <laughs> kidding, kidding. Oh, he's holding a shot. He's holding a shot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what it is. Wow. Kidding. NRA Jesus. Amen. <laughs> hey, I was also doing some research on Rastafarians, and I found it interesting how yeah. they, be- they believe that Jesus was God, but they also believe that God has been reincarnate in mm-hmm. other people as well. That's bizarre. Specifically, uh, the, the I guess, Jesus that they follow was like this king in a specific country in Africa, and he did mm-hmm. all these great things for the, the country. The Rastafarian? Yeah. 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 And, Haile Selassie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that Ethiopian. guy. Ethiopian. And he even said, he's like, I'm not God, but they were like, you're I yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, he gets a bad rap in his <laughs> because yeah. he's like, no, 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 don't do that. Wait. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, we like to kind of change who he was. Um, when we should be conforming to his image, we like to conform him to what we want him to look like. Um, I, I, I kind of like the Asian Jesus. I don't know. It's like he could drop kick you as well. Yeah. You know, judge your neighbor. Okay to say. All right, discovering. That was a little bit. Was that okay? Just, <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I like I like to liken um, discovering the true identity of our master as in a way it's almost like this uh, theological archaeology because um, over the course of two thousand years people have you know been scooping and throwing stuff back in on our ar- archaeology archaeological dig and we're always trying to read you know it's kind of like drinking upstream like if you're you know in a mountain mountainous area you don't want to like drink you know like go to the Mississippi River for instance. Um, I've been the Mississippi River way up in like Wisconsin and then I've been the Mississippi River like down in New Orleans and I've crossed the Mississippi River in both places and you want to be drinking the one way up in Wisconsin you know <laughs> not the one way down in, in New Orleans or anything like that um, so it's like we want to make sure we're drinking from way upstream without all the pollutants in it and all the you know the silt and everything else yeah. but people are all the time trying to throw that stuff back in and cover up the archaeological div trying to figure out who is he as a, as a historical figure, but also as our savior, who is he and, and how do we pattern and conform our lives after his? And um, so I just do that there, like, kind of like that analogy. Um, something I want to talk about real fast was um, the, early, the early Yeshua movement, if I can call it that. Um, uh, this is kind of wordy here, but the ministry and teachings of Yeshua took place in a tense political and religious setting. We talked about that a second ago about the Romans occupying the land of Israel. And here comes the suffering servant on the scene. Um, and they didn't really like that idea at that time. They were like, no, we want the conquering king to overthrow our oppressors. Uh, the Romans were very oppressive. They, they allowed for a lot of religious freedoms, but um, you know, the point that they were crucifying people every day of the week, probably hundreds of people every day of the week. Um, and then once, uh, you know, the, the, um, city of Jerusalem was leveled in 70 AD. Um, I mean, they had thousands of people lined up crucified on the streets for people to see. Just thousands and thousands. Um, after they laid siege to the city of Jerusalem and starved people to death for uh, Lord knows how long. But they're just a brutal, brutal. You did not want to get on their bad side. So when Yeshua comes on the scene and he's saying things like, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's, that didn't really jive with the, the normal like Jewish mind. And you got to remember too that he came into the, the, the scene in the land of Galilee, where um, that was a very, um, like if you can compare it to like the Bible Belt in America, like there's this like, they call it the Bible Belt because there's this belt around America where there's a lot of fundamentalist biblical ideologies that are still intact in America. A lot of Judeo-Christian values that are still intact. And that's a good thing. But if you, uh, the, the Bible Belt of the, of the land of Israel in that time would have been very much the land of Galilee. Like the, the um, 
uh, Nazareth and the, around the Sea of um, uh, Sea of Galilee. That would have been a very Bible Belt area. Um, this is where I mean we're talking like where um, when Judah Maccabee uh, started the the Maccabean revolt, which was like 150 years prior to the time of Jesus in the, in the Book of Maccabees, like we're talking about leading up to Hanukkah, like he fled to this area, and like this is this is a very like um, Bible Belt area. And so when the Romans come in and they start oppressing these people and introducing polytheism and uh, temple prostitution and all these nasty things that otherwise, like, the Jewish people were very, very pure, very um, uh, monotheistic, it, it was just like this, you know, spit in the face. And so they were looking for that Judah Maccabee again who would come and cleanse the temple and wipe out all the enemies and be, you know, the this, this savior and set up peace and security. Um, and we do see Yeshua going into the temple and cleansing the temple, but kind of on a different level. Um, so I put the first century temple worship was centered on purity and nat- national restoration. Um, the temple was the center of the faith at that time, the temple in Jerusalem. And um, we see even until its destruction, the priests were still active um, even 40 years after the, the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. The priests were still active the early believers were still even going to worship at the temple that stood in Jerusalem. It was still the religious center um, of, of the faith. The early believers in Messiah were still basing their faith around that temple worship system in Jerusalem. Um, uh, it was still the spiritual center of the Yeshua movement. Um, and in the book of Acts, it's called as the sect known as the way. Um, what do I base this on? Well, Acts chapter 2, 46, we see that the believers gathered in the temple, in the temple proper, when the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was given. Acts 3, 1, uh, John 2, 13. Acts 15, we see the uh, Jerusalem council. It's still centered in Jerusalem. The leaders of the, the early sect known as the Way, the Yeshua movement, they were based out of Jerusalem. Um, Acts chapter 21 was another big one. Um, Paul goes to the temple to make and to take a vow. It says in Acts chapter 21, he goes to take a vow. That vow is likely the Nazarite vow from Numbers chapter 6. And so he's going to the temple to bring offerings, um, which this was this was happening like, you know, 20, 25 years after the ministry of Yeshua, that he's still going to the temple. That's still the center of faith to the early the early movement known as the way. Um, we see, uh, um, you know, Paul being later arrested and, and later in Acts right there and, and then tried by the Sanhedrin. Um, but it was very much every, where everything was at. Um, it even says in the book of Acts that even some of the priests started to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, but they were still operating as priests, um, which is weird to think about that, like, the temple was still a, a thing that was going strong at least for 40 years after his death. Um, so when the gospel spread to the outlying Jewish communities throughout Asia Minor, like, for example, Rome, uh, Ephesus, Corinth, Antioch, um, these people weren't as close to the temple as those Jews were. So they were a little bit more susceptible to like pagan influence and, and um, polytheism and different things like that. That's when uh, it started piquing the interest of some of these Gentiles who were like, hey, there's this you know, savior who died for me and my sins. I want to cleanse my life and be, you know, convert into this faith. And so then they would flood the synagogues. All these you know, Gentiles who wanted to believe in the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would then flood the synagogues and so there would be like, you know, I don't know the, the true percentages, but there would be an overwhelming majority of Gentiles. And what were these? Um, it'd be like if, if um, you know, a thousand Lakelanders who didn't have any modicum of the, the Jewish faith, knowledge of the Jewish faith, suddenly converged on the local synagogue here in Lakeland, who maybe have a dozen attendees on a regular basis. Right. And suddenly we all go in with all our baggage, all of our religious baggage, you know, and like we're coming from all these different pagan ideas and um, faiths and some of us just went and visited you know this this temple to Artemis last night but we want to go in and we want to see what this God of Israel is all about so we're going to flood to the one place we know of where that is being taught and that is the local synagogue so a thousand of us just converge on this local synagogue and the local rabbi is like what do I do with all these people and so that's why we see a lot of Paul's letters to all these different synagogues and these little communities all over Asia Minor because he's like we got a big problem on our hands. We have all these, these Gentiles coming from all these different backgrounds and they're creating a lot of ruckus, you know, obviously, like, that would be the natural outcome of all that. 
Um, so he's writing all these letters, you know, sending them off to all these different communities and trying to figure out what do we do with the Gentiles? What do we do with them? How do they fit into this? And it became an overwhelmingly Gentile populated faith by then. And then to kick it all off, um, in 70 AD, Rome was leveled, or not Rome, uh, Jerusalem was leveled, the temple was destroyed, um, the Jewish population in, in the land of Judea was just decimated. And suddenly we have this shift, what was the temple being the, the center of the faith, over across the Mediterranean Sea to the largest population um, of Jews, which would have been Rome at that time. Um, and so Paul's writing a lot of letters to Romans, he's, he's visiting Rome, um, well, actually, he doesn't visit Rome till, till after his arrest. But um, when that shift took place from the temple, from Jerusalem, from all that stuff that was talked about in the Bible to this random place that is not mentioned in the Bible called Rome, suddenly there's, the theology shifted with it. And uh, all those Roman Gentiles that were coming into the faith, of the, the, um, coming into the knowledge of, of Jesus, but coming into the knowledge and the expression of belief in the God of Israel... Um, you know, there was just a lot of baggage that came in. And so um, a lot of Paul's letters in the book of Romans were dealing with, with all of those issues that, that they were bringing in with them. Um, you know, the book of Corinthians, he's writing to addressing a lot of issues and things. So um, that's a big deal when it shifted from Jerusalem to Rome. And then from there, what do we see? You know, um, we see Roman Catholicism come into play, Constantine in the fourth century. And a lot of things started becoming more Gentile-led, whereas before it was a very Jewish-led faith. I mean, Jesus was Jewish. Uh, all his 12 disciples were Jewish. Every book of the Bible, with maybe the exception of Luke, some people think that Luke was maybe a convert to Judaism, all of them were written by Jews. Um, it was a very Jewish-centered thing, and then suddenly it becomes a, kind of like a Roman-led thing. Um, and we may talk about this next week, but that brought with it a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, and so that's kind of the stuff I want to start digging through and see, like, what was it like in the first century? What, how do they live out their faith from day to day? And... Um, that's kind of what I want. I want to get back to the simplicity of that and, and get back to the sect known as the way and see what it was like. Um, and uh, that's kind of that, if I go back to, um, I didn't really touch too much on this, but so Messiah ben Yosef, he goes into Egypt, becomes a ruler, and then starts to reveal himself to his brothers. Um, that sent out shockwaves within his family, but also within the Egyptian community. I mean, think of if you were, if you were uh, a servant of this number two guy in all the superpower of the world, to be like the, uh, the vice president or like you know, somebody big like that in a superpower of the world, and suddenly he reveals to you that he's a Hebrew, came from very humble Hebrew shepherd bringings, you'd be like, whoa, like this, I thought this guy was big stuff, you know, like, and here he is, he has this pedigree, you know, and like that's, that was in shockwaves within Egypt itself. Hey, did you hear that, that Joseph is actually a Hebrew? He's actually a nomad? Like, did you guys hear that? And um, so the same thing happens with, with Jesus. I mean, Jesus becomes, in, in all appearances, a Gentile. He, um, he takes on Gentile, and he changes his name. I mean, he goes from Yeshua ben Yosef, his father was Joseph, to uh, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And those are, those are all things that happen supernaturally by design, because he needed to go into the Gentile world and become the savior of the Gentile world. Like Paul says, um, you know, to the Jew first and then the Gentile, but then Paul later says that um, you know, there was a partial blindness that came over the Jews until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So Paul is aware of this weird connection between Joseph and Jesus being concealed in his true identity. But then we see later at the end, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, we see the true identity of who Jesus was being revealed not only to his brothers, which in the past 50 years, there's been more Jews coming to the faith in Jesus as the Messiah than there's been ever in the history of you know. Of, of since he's walked the earth. And so as he's revealing himself to his Jewish brethren, it's also sending shockwaves throughout the Gentile community, which is predominantly, you know, the Christian faith. As we're beginning to see, whoa, what does it mean that he was Jewish? Like, there's a lot more involved with this than we thought. So he's revealing, just like Joseph revealed to the Egyptians that he was a Hebrew, Jesus is revealing that he's Yeshua ben Yosef. So it's kind of this interesting uh, parallel there. Um, but it's all by design, and it's all meant to happen, and it's a beautiful thing. We talked about the cates at the end, sealed up to the end. A um, uh, couple more slides here. Understanding Jewish and understanding Jesus in his religious and cultural context, it shouldn't detract from the beautiful simplicity of the gospel message, but rather it should overlay a deeper appreciation and weightiness to its purpose. It's co- at its core, 
this endeavor is a quest to know what it means to be and to make disciples. So in essence, basically to summarize all that up, like if uh, we get like way into this Bible study and we, uh, we have a, a lesser appreciation for our Savior, then we've done it wrong. Like, you know, the saying like you're doing it wrong. But all this should be to glorify our, our, our Messiah. It should be to elevate him and, and to welcome him as king. When he does return, he will be our king. Um, and it's to honor him. So if we, if we miss that point, then it's all for naught, is what I guess what I'm saying. And then also to be a better disciple. Um, that's, that's our one job, is to be a disciple and to make disciples. And so how can you make a disciple if you don't really know what discipleship is and then what your rabbi did and how he taught? So that's kind of at my, my, um, my burden, I guess, my heart, where my heart is at, is being a good disciple and so I can make better disciples. Um, so I think this is my last slide. The goal of this Bible study group, if you guys come back again, you're more than welcome to. I love that. But uh, number one, I want to examine the teachings and ministry of Jesus through uh, a lens of the first century Hebraic thinking and then become better imitators of our rabbi um, and then thus become more equipped to go out and make more imitators of him. All right. You guys want to add anything? Any questions? No? I was hoping you guys would do the majority. I think the, what, is it a ketz? Was that the word for the awakening? Uh, miketz, yeah. Miketz. Miketz, so the end. Oh, the end or the awakening. So I'm not sure if, like, we talked about it earlier. And, like, I guess what the connection with the, the Joseph and the revealing was that, um, that, like, Right now, you're saying that there's like an awakening. Yeah. At if the this end. Is, if this is the end. Yeah. Or, you know, there is like. Yeah. The end slash an awakening of and a revealing. Yeah. So if this is the miquettes, the end, the end, the, the, if we're in truly in the end days, um, the end times, then uh, there might also come an awakening of his true essence, of his true identity, just as Joseph revealed. His true identity to the Egyptians. Just like, yeah, the revealing an awakening came after he was used to save. Um, yeah. a, like, if he had just stayed with his family, he, um, he was never sold into slavery. He could not have saved what was the biggest um, like civilization at the time, Egypt yeah. was like the high, the world power at the time. Yeah, and yeah. like, I guess if his brothers were coming there to get food, then people from like all the surrounding nations theoretically were coming yeah. to buy food. So like, yeah. saving the, the world, world yeah. the world at that time, and so yeah. like, uh, that that being like what Jesus did when, um, uh, like he was taken basically. Uh, through the vehicle of like when Christianity came out of Rome, yeah. it looked a lot differently. But um, it's all by plan. That it, that it's all by yeah, design. That it like saved ultimately. Yeah. It went out to the world. It it made it a, a bigger vehicle. Yeah, we talked earlier about um, Stacey and I were talking about how we call we call it the Ju- Judeo Christian values. Like that's what we say in in America. Um, and what does that what does that imply? That we have. Like our constitution in the United States of America, at least, is set upon Judeo-Christian values, which involve like Ju- Judaism and Christianity, and those values that are packaged within that, and that's how we started making our laws, is based on those Judeo-Christian values, and that's how we run our country, and that's how we interact with each other. And so I can go down the road and find someone who doesn't practice any form of religion or anything like that, and they can treat me based on those that Judeo-Christian culture, even if they are completely atheistic, they at least treat me with a, with a mutual respect um, because we're founded. So what the message of Jesus did as it spread literally around the globe at this point is it, it kind of almost like um, formed these Judeo-Christian values in almost, I mean, definitely in every continent, but in almost every major country, there are these underlying Judeo-Christian values, whether they embrace it or not, because of this one rabbi who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, who we believe is the creator who took on flesh. But, I mean, that just sent, like, these shockwaves around the world. And um, 
you know, it's, it's, there's going to be another round of, I, I believe, another round of shockwaves as he, re, as he comes as the king and not only reveals himself to his brethren, but also reveals himself to us in an, almost a new layer, um, almost like in fulfilling that story of Joseph. But yeah, it's all by design, I'd say. I mean, he, he literally saved the world. If you look at how we got out of the dark ages, how we, you know, how we've made such huge achievements in science and medicine, it's all because of those Judeo-Christian values and because we believe in a God, we believe that um, there is a creator, and all those things elevated us in civilization, just like Joseph elevated Egypt to a next level of civilization. But anything else you all want to add? I'll, um, let me skip forward. I think, uh, next week, um, I was going to talk about why the shift, like, why the shift from, like, this very Jewish faith to, like, what we see when we walk into, like, any church today. Um, would Jesus, like, recognize that? You know, would he feel at home there? Why or why not? Um, what, what caused that shift? There's very instrumental people in history, in the history of the church, who have shifted, um, intentionally um, away from these things because of a bias against anything looking Jewish. And I'll pull up some quotes and stuff that we can throw some quotes up here um, from different church fathers who, who intentionally was like, they were like, get away from that stuff, you know? Um, and then I want to look at discipleship. What is discipleship uh, from a Judaic? I mean, we have a lot of books in like Christianity about discipleship, you know, seven steps to be a good disciple. But like, I want to look at it. What is it? What do the rabbis say in the time of Jesus? What were they thinking? Like, because that's, that's the world that Yeshua operated in, was like a first century Jewish world. And when he says, go and make disciples, I want to know what did they hear and what did they think when they heard the word disciple. Um, and I'll kind of try to bring some of those things through next week. But maybe you guys can, uh, I was going to give you guys a chance to, to research some of that and see what you can bring to the table too. Because, yeah. I already have a whole bunch of homework on this. Right on, right on. <laughs> see, those papers doubled as, uh, as notes. So... Well, cool. Uh, let me close this in prayer, and then um, uh, what we're going to do is Havdalah, and Havdalah is a traditional ceremony that dates back thousands of years. The Jewish people have been doing it for a long time. I was going to close in prayer, and then let you guys sing one more song, and then um, and we'll do Havdalah. Havdalah is a ceremony that closes out the Sabbath. So at sundown tonight, which has already gone down, traditionally would end the Sabbath, and we're now on the first day of the week where we can begin, resume work and everything else. But... Um, this is how Jesus would have closed out a Sabbath, which is kind of cool. I mean, we think about, like, if we want to be imitators of him, um, we're doing something literally that he probably did every week of his life is close out the Sabbath with a ceremony similar to this. Um, and uh, so it's kind of cool that as, uh, as an imitator that we're, we're just doing this everyday thing that he did. Um, so we'll do that, and I'll, I'll show you guys uh, the ins and outs of that. But, yeah, I'll let, you, I'll let Josh and, uh, and Carrie play another song here. Let me close this in prayer. Father, we thank you so much. Uh, we thank you that you, um, you're a God who likes to hear our petitions. You're a God who is um, concerned about the individual and concerned about us as your creation. Thank you that you made us in your image. Father, um, thank you for your word that you gave us. Uh, there's many other faiths out there that, that are based off uh, a false notion, uh, just this abstract being that doesn't have any revelation of who he or she is. But Father, you're a God who, who spoke to us and gave us revelation very clearly in your word, and I thank you for that tonight. Thank you for everyone who is here tonight, and um, I ask that you would just uh, take all that they, they heard and, and learned and go back and, and pray on it and test it and not just believe it, but be able to go back and verify it. And then um, maybe come next week with some insights and maybe some more questions and that we would just be able to um, build friendships and relationships and bear each other's burdens. And I pray for each and every one of them as they go out tonight, that you'd keep them safe as they travel home. And in Yeshua's name we pray, amen. Amen. Yes.
rest on His unchanging grace.
these have all the traditional buses and things. So uh, Abdallah is a Hebrew word, which means the separation. Because um, uh, God commanded us to sanctify the Sabbath um, and to make it holy. And that literally, there's like a literal connection to that, where you literally, at the beginning of Sabbath, Stacy lights candles and she says a blessing that says, basically, we welcome the Sabbath. And the Sabbath starts now. So it was like this formal declaration that we're starting the Sabbath Friday at sundown. And then Saturday at sundown, there's a formal declaration we're ending the Sabbath. Um, the Sabbath, ultimately, I mean, um, when God gave the Sabbath, it was kind of like a picture of something. Um, there's one one day of seven days uh, that we uh, take rest, and we just stop all our labors, and we just trust in His provision, and um, just kind of meditate on Him, and we just... But what it is, really, is the window into the Messianic kingdom. And when, when Messiah comes and reigns on earth, during His millennial reign, that is the... That is the epitome of the Sabbath. And that is the full essence of the Sabbath. So what we do every week is kind of just a foreshadow of that coming Messianic kingdom. Um, and so there's a lot of like imagery with closing out the Sabbath. Um, it's kind of a bitter thing because we enjoy the Sabbath and we delight in it. And we don't want to go back to work because we like to just hang out. But, um, but there's a lot of like bittersweet stuff with it. So uh, the first thing is the candle. It's a bright candle. It has, I think this has 12 wicks. Be careful. Has 12 wicks. Um, sometimes we'll have six or seven for every day of the week, but um, this one's a special one. And then we've got grape juice. Careful, Lash. And then we've got, um, he does this every week, so he's, we've got spices here, this little weird spice thing. And so the Sabbath, um, just like the Messianic kingdom, when it comes, believe it in there, okay? You want to you have for it in there? I wanted it because it was a candle. Elijah, I have something for you. Come here. Just like the Messianic Kingdom, when it comes into fruition and Messiah reigns on earth, as 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 um, Messiah ben David, the conquered king, it will engage all of our senses, like all of our our sight and our smell, and um, it will bring joy. Grape grape juice or wine is a symbol of joy and, and celebration. Flame, uh, a light, is a symbol of like delight. It brings warmth. It um, and then uh, smell. It it brings like. So it's like a little sweetness. So it engages all of our senses, just like the Sabbath engages our senses. It's something that we delight in. It's something that brings joy. Um, so uh, what we teach in our family is that this um, this candle represents um, our Savior, the light of the world. And so sometimes, even within traditional Jewish homes, um, when it comes time for the blessing of the candle, you will see the kids and the adults will, um, will hold our hands up to the candle, and you'll see... Um, the candle through your fingers, and then you'll compare like your fingernails to it and see if your fingernails are dirty, different things like that. It's kind of like the first act of work for the week is to like use the light to do something. And um, what we do is we teach that Yeshua is our is our savior. He's the light of the world, and so we compare ourselves to His light and see, okay, throughout the week, what do we have to work on? What do we have to improve ourselves? And it kind of teaches us, like, okay, by next Sabbath, are we going to be a little bit better in this area of our lives? And um, so we kind of use that to teach them that. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and kick things off. Um, I use my sedure here for it. Uh, uh, this one from uh, Saint Petersburg. Or, uh, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. So I'll read this real fast. The, braid, the braided candle, usually held by a young person, is for most as believers symbolic of our joining together with Messiah in His Sabbath and festivals. We become one in Him and one with Him. So it's like the candles becomes one, the true light of the world. A spice box containing cloves and cinnamon reminds us of the sweetness of Shabbat, of Sabbath, a little of which we carry over into the new week. Um, and then at the end of this, we'll sing Elijah the prophet, which is a song that we'll sing. Um, and it's looking forward to the coming of Elijah, who is the, he's supposed to usher in the Sabbath, like John the Baptist, or it's supposed to usher in the, the Messiah. Like John the Baptist was operating in the spirit of Elijah. We believe, you know, in the two witnesses who will come and usher in the Messiah again. Um, so I'll go ahead and read this blessing, and then uh, Noah, would you mind lighting the candle with us? You have to look at the ads right there. It's going to be a big flame because it's a new candle. Do you want to direction the fire? Yeah, I see. Okay, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord my God is my strength and my song, and he has also become my salvation. Or we just learned a little while ago, my Yeshua, my salvation. And with joy you shall draw waters from the, from the wells of Yeshua, from salvation. 
Yeshua is the Lord's. Upon your people be your blessing, Selah. The Lord of hosts is with us. A stronghold for us is the God of Jacob, Selah. Lord of hosts, praise is the man who trusts in you. Lord, save and may the king answer us on the day when we call. The Jews have light and gladness, joy and honor. So may it be for us. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Um, something we do in our home is try to sing it. I'm going to try to do it for you. I'll do it. I'll kick us off. So you guys need to come close if you want to see the you want to see the papers. Um, we do a little melody. It goes lie 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 just like that. Okay, and then we'll do that one time, and then I'll sing the Hebrew blessing, and then we'll go back into the lie lie thing. Okay, ready? Take a deep breath.
We count the eight because eight is the we're on the eighth day now, technically the first day. We say Shavua Tov, which means have a good week. We say it eight times, so we count. Ready? Shavua Tov, 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 Shavua Tov. Have a good week. Where's my hat? As soon as the Kool Aid comes out, we're leaving. I don't know. You were probably leaving when you told them that. Yeah, yeah. We're like, wait a second. Yes, Michelle was like, wait, let me explain this for a second. I could already see it. I was like, the whole thing, and I was like, wait a minute, in case, like, yeah. No? Yeah, I'm glad you. Me too. And he was sitting there like, okay, this is my last time here. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, put your things together. Like, oh, I have Grab your purse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I already think I had just come out of that point. I think I missed that. Because usually I'm the one to catch right. if games do something like that. I'm like, oh, I'm like, yeah. oh no, game. Let me clarify what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Let me iron this out. Awesome. So you were. It's just like what he said though, it's just pretty, it's a oh. you know, it's just a deep oh. walk. It's it awesome. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And it was awesome being for us before, like, yeah. around just like, cool, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 And this was my first time in Abdallah. Yeah, because um, cool. my dad was the one, yeah. and Brandon was like, oh, no. and we were going to yeah. yeah. the classes over there, and they were yeah. coming in from their home. Yeah. And we left. We just like, see y'all, bye, have a great time. And we didn't even, like, it was awesome. Was yeah. it at Big Tequila? No, it was at um, Yeshua and their company. Oh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little place where they um, go to yeah, Sprout, Drumstone, Lumsden, and it's um, in like so a little place. Can you find your keys? Mm -hmm. Sounds right. Um, yeah, it's right by the rule. It's near Blue yeah. Rock, but it's in a sense, it's, it's like different people. And I think they're from all different Walks places and, and all different um, churches. So. The thing is, if you ever go to like a missing synagogue or anything, it's like people there are like so diverse. Like people are like, I mean, like kind of near, like we have people from like Catholic background or like you know, Jewish, Christian. It's a very diverse thing. All united with the fact that we follow this, you know, the same, the same Savior. Well, thank you so yeah. much for inviting yes, us. Yeah, yeah, we're coming. And thank you for the food yeah. and everything. Yeah. 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 Y
picture, and this is what happens in a split second. I'm like literally doing this. There's that. Uh huh. Sad. 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 Sad.